Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning on our third episode of the Paralympic podcast. We have the pleasure today of hosting Roy Turnham, Paralympic footballer. Um, thank you for joining us today, Roy. Pleasure. Nice to be here, particularly on a sunny day. Lovely weather outside for those that are, are not out at the moment. Uh, just before we kick off with some of the questions for Roy, if I could just remind everybody to place their microphones on mute just so there's no sound disturbance that uh, affects Roy being able to hear some of the questions. If you do at any point want to submit a question for Roy, you can do it of one or two ways. The first way is via the chat service on the Zoom call which we have. You can submit your questions and then I will ask you if you'd like to go over and uh, ask your question to Roy. The alternate option to that is if you use the thumbs up sign on the uh, Zoom application, that will notify me that you have a question and then we'll be able to unmute yourself and direct your question to Roy. So we're going to get kicked off, Roy. Uh, the first question that I had sent to me for yourself was just could you, uh, first of all, give us a little bit of an introduction about who you are, what sports you're involved in? Um, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, my name is Roy Turnham. Um, I've been, um, I've had my eye condition since birth, um, which particular condition I've got, I meant by the time that I was five or six years old, um, I had nothing more than light and dark perception. Um, I've always played sport through the use of senses other than sight. So um, first memories of playing sport um, was, was, was with, a, with a ball with a sound in it. Um, by the way, if I get some heckling, it's because I'm trackside. We just started running our group um, exercise session. And um, yeah, there's um, some of our service users are, uh, are enjoying a good a walk and a jog and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, anyway, so back, back to what I was saying. So yeah, my, my, my sort of, um, my sporting background, um, when I was, when I was a child, I got the opportunity to try a lot of different sports. I feel very, um, very fortunate really. My, my family, um, are all big into sport and my close family are all visually impaired. Um, my parents, um, had knowledge of how um, a lot of visually impaired sports were played. So um, I never, I didn't really go through that 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 sort of um, phase that I know a lot of people go through, where they have to actually find out what what they can do before they can actually take part in it. You know, I, I just grew up with a with um, with a level of accessibility in sports. My parents were very keen for myself, my brother, and my sister to go through mainstream education, um, and with their support, we were able to to be completely integrated really. Um, I would still say that PE um, was one of, the sp one of the subjects that had particular challenges, um, particularly when my, uh, my sighted friends realized that I couldn't hear the ball much in the air so they could just chip the ball over me. So that was, um, that was, <laughs> that was interesting. However, I did have a very, um, a very, a very wise young teacher um, who came in and he quickly realized that he had to make the sessions more more fair so that I could participate. So particularly with football, I remember him saying to the group, he said, right, today we're going to play like Brazil. So how did Brazil play? And of course, they all they all sort of spoke about the, um, you know, their particular footwork skills and keeping the ball on the floor. So he said, OK, so we're going to play like that. So we're going to make sure that the ball doesn't go above shoulder height. And it was a really clever way of including me without making the session all about me. Um, so I was very lucky to meet people like that. This, this particular teacher then went on to become um, a regular guide runner for me. And he actually um, ran with me when I was uh, competed in the World Junior Cross Country Championships when I was 17. Um, athletics was my first sport that I got into competitively. Um, and I moved on to blind football in my early 20s. Um, there wasn't really a blind football league um, in place at the time when, when, I was, when I was a teenager. So even though I loved football, um, I wasn't really able to play it competitively um, until I was a bit older. 
But once I got the chance, I, I was just going to, I made my mind up, I was going to make the best of the opportunity. Um, I managed to break into the England, um, into the England blind football squad uh, when I was 26. And um, for eight years, um, I was full time with the football and I totally enjoyed it. It's been one of the most amazing experiences of my life. It's allowed me to meet some amazing people. Um, but along the way, I also realized that I wanted to make a difference for lots of other visually impaired people as well, because I, I, I quickly learned that not, not everybody had the same, the, same, um, the same introductions to sport as what I'd had. So um, I'm also involved in a lot of projects that hopefully will support other visually impaired people to do that. That's fantastic, Roy, and you're doing some great work there. Um, you spoke about, obviously, some of your early memories of playing sport. Um, many youngsters had sporting idols or people who inspired them during their childhood. Was there a particular athlete or individual that you sort of looked up to and aspired to be as you were growing up? I kind of look at this on two levels because I think sometimes for our, for our idols, we look too far away. and. Um, it's, it's um, for me, I would say one of my most important role models was my older brother um, because he was a lot bigger, a lot stronger, a lot uglier than me um, <laughs> growing up. Um, but I idolised him and it was great to have someone so close to me who actually played sport in the same way as what I did. So I, I you know, I, I loved, I grew up with football. Um, I, I idolised uh, Gianfranco Zola as a footballer. Um, I've, I've, I've been a Chelsea supporter since a very young age. I'm sorry, I know probably a lot of people are going to leave the meeting now after I've said that. But um, the thing is, is that it, my, my, my most important role models are probably my close family. Um, I learned so much off of them. And yes, you know, um, sort of athletes that I got to listen to on the radio performing and, and, on the, and watch on the telly. They were important as well, but yeah, I'd say my close family are probably my our biggest role models. That's great that you're you know you're so humble about your family members being your role models, Roy, and that's the same for many other people who are involved in sport. Um, while we're sort of on the subject of your family, obviously you come from a an excellent sporting pedigree as such, you know both siblings involved in, in sport. So who was the, sort of the most competitive out of yourself and your siblings? <laughs> um, I was very competitive. My, my, brother's, my brother's nine years older than me. So whenever we were playing football or cricket or anything like that in the, you know, in the back garden or the local park, you know, I had to work so hard to be able to, to beat him. Um, so I had that advantage of always being in a situation where I guess I was I guess I was the underdog and um, my sister is incredibly competitive I mean you have to be if you've got two older brothers and she was very she became very 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 good at um, you know at looking after herself and fending for herself and um, you know she's she's gone on to be you know a, um, a very very successful Paralympic cyclist you know she's got an MBE and a gold medal and is um, and doing some other amazing things as well herself. So, yeah, I'd say I'd say we're all competitive in our own way, um, and um, I, I guess that's the main reason why we've been able to go on and do the things that we have. That's great, Roy. We've just had a question from one of our uh, audience, uh, a gentleman called Mark, and he's from Goldball UK, and he's. Uh -huh. asked, um, if, like, what advice would you give to a young person who wants to progress in sport? I think first advice I would give is you have to believe that there's things out there for yourself and don't always believe the negativity that you might receive from people who don't know a lot about the capabilities of someone with a visual impairment. Um, I think that sometimes my experience with, um, particularly with working with, with young visually impaired people in schools, 
is that they can receive a lot of negativity from from teachers and from from um, people who are who are really there to support them. And it's not it's not malicious. It's just a lack of knowledge. And you cannot you mustn't believe that your eye condition is the reason that you cannot take part in sport. People may tell you that oh you can't play football because you can't see very well or we can't include you in this session because you can't see very well. No, they can't include you in this session because they don't know how to include you. There are things out there and you always have to believe that that's possible. Be be inquisitive, question everything and you know if if people aren't looking for the information that you need um try and find it out yourself if you if you have to because i tell you there's a lot out there's a lot out there and um you know it's it's so important um it's so important for you you know it's so important for you to explore all of these uh, opportunities and encourage others to do the same for for you for your benefit Thank you for that answer, Ron. I hope that answered your question, uh, Mark. While we're sort of on the subject of different opportunities, Roy, um, obviously sport is a fantastic way to build your personal skills, develop relationships. It can often present, you know, people like yourself with many different opportunities. So what sort of opportunities is sport giving you in other areas of your life? Oh, it's... You, whenever people are talking about, you know, advice, particularly career advice, so there's a, one of the sort of sets of buzzwords is transferable skills, isn't it? And is it, there's a few things that um, are really important that sport has done for me. Um, on a physical, um, on a physical level, um, sport teaches you how to hold yourself well. It teaches you to to, to be physically confident as well as um, mentally confident. So think about, you know, when you sit in a job interview and your, um, your body language and, and how you hold yourself, um, whether we like it or not, that has an influence on how people, how people what, what people think of you. Um, having good posture is good for your, well, it's just good for your all over, you know, your all over health and well-being anyway. Um, I think it's, it's all of the corners of physical, social side of things. You know, I've met some of my greatest. Friends through playing. You know, the job I have now, I'm a project coordinator for a sight loss organization. So I, I am able to, um, I've, I've been, um, you know, my employers have given me, my employers at Site Support Hull in East Yorkshire given me this amazing opportunity and had faith in me that I can that I can coordinate this project and and bring other visually impaired people um into a world of of um you know health and activity. So you know I, I would say um sport also has allowed me to travel. Um you know I've seen that so many amazing places um you know, from Australia, all well, all the all the different contents of continents of the world. You know, I've been able to visit. Um, it's it's just it's just that thing. I would say the most important thing is the confidence. You know, blind football, for instance. You know, it's taught it's enhanced my spatial awareness skills incredibly. You know, that ability. Think about it. Yeah, you might look at a game of football and th and and think of the multi-directional stuff and and um, and you know the the skills of being able to change direction with a ball at your feet and move from A to B and then back to A and back and from A to B to C, you know, and still know where you are. They're they're so important. I've always said that I think um, pe people who provide services in teaching people mobility and rehabilitation should tap into the world of sports and those those sorts of sports more to allow people to improve those spatial awareness skills i mean just think about it in the home or in a in an unfamiliar place if you've got that kind of spatial awareness that you've learned through sport it's going to help you to be more confident even in you know more unfamiliar unfamiliar surroundings yeah that's definitely a, a true roy we've just had a, a question submitted into the zoom chat now from mark Gullwell. 
who is uh, based down in Bristol. So I'd like to just ask Mark if he'd like to ask your uh, ask you your question, please, Mark. Hi, Roy. Nice to meet you. Hi, Mark. So I, I'm I've been trying to get people into sport for many many years. Uh, I've founded the Australian uh, Blind Cricket Team, and I've been around sport for many years myself. What do you think are the biggest barriers to getting new people into sport? People that have lost their sight. Um, there are barriers to stopping people, but what do you find is a good way to overcome those barriers? I think, and I, I think as a, as a coach or certainly a deliverer of, um, of activities or, you know, when, when you're presented with somebody in that situation, I think it's really important to allow them to Often, often people know more about their, particularly their their situation than than we do, say as, as coaches or coordinators. And it's kind of allowing them to to sort of to speak first. You know, one of the I always remember one of the things I went to decided I wanted to try something new a few years ago, and I went to um, a kung fu session, and the the instructor, the first thing he said to me was. Um, you know, what, what do you think I need to do to help you? So he kind of put the ball in my court, really. Um, and what he was implying was, you know, can we, can we work together on this? You know, can we, I'm willing to, you know, I've, it, obviously his knowledge in, in, the, in the, the Kung Fu world was infinitely better than mine. But he gave us a chance to work together by asking me a question. You know, and I think there has to be a desire to learn um, when you're a when you're coaching someone with a visual impairment or when you're looking to deliver sessions. Is look, explore all of the information that's available to you. Um, you know, I had a teacher phone me up a few years ago when I was first getting into sort of more of a um, coaching sort of role, and he said to me, he said, "I know nothing about um, visually impaired sport." And I've just got this child who's come into my class and he's, you know, he's totally blind. But I looked on the internet and I saw your sports club and, you know, I got in touch. And that was brilliant because he, he recognised that he didn't know, but he recognised there were things that he could learn. Um, I think we have to tap into the knowledge that's within the visually impaired community. I think that's really important. And, you know, and create a network where, we use everybody's skills um, together. You know, those with those specific skills in in coaching mainstream sports. Mm. You know, link them with these with people, I guess, like myself and others who've who've had these experiences, positive experiences through through being involved in in sport, and and create create that real um, that that network that's really gonna really gonna help push push things forward i think after the the paralympics um when they were in london that really did change the game for, for sports with dis or disability sports all across the board um, and i think that awareness uh, of what people are capable of is what brings people uh, more in line uh, would you agree i agree um and i got i got asked this question a lot particularly after coming back from london 2012 was um, do you think the, the, the games will change things for disability sport? And what I said, and it still rings true now for me, is that those, what, the games, what the games did was they gave people a taste. They gave people a chance to, to see what is possible. But the thing was, is those people they were watching, particularly, you know, you think of a, a, a parent with a young child, for instance, who's got visual impairments or somebody who's just recently lost their sight, they might be wowed by what they've seen, but it doesn't bring them any closer to actually getting involved with that particular sport themselves. We have to, we can't just expect that a big event is going to, it's going to like flick a switch and everybody's all of a sudden going to be accessing sport. We have to make those things available on a local level. It's those first, first and second steps. You know, it's, it, it's um, sorry. I'm just getting um, 
I was just <laughs> a message was coming through on my phone from the from the group, so I've just muted it. It's, it's just putting me off. Um, yeah, so I think um, I think that um, it's um, it's really important. I've lost my train of thought now. Um, I'm getting heckled again from uh, from my group. <laughs> but um, no, as yeah, I was saying, I just think we really need to make sure that when these events happen, if somebody if it appeals to somebody that they've got those opportunities locally to actually make that first step into whatever sport it is they're inspired to take part in. Yeah. Thank you, Roy. Appreciate that. Thank you for <laughs> the question, Mark. Um, Roy, we have another question that's been submitted in on our uh, Zoom group chat. Um, yep. So this one is from Catherine. Sorry, um, Katie Shepherd. Sorry. Um, so I'd like to open Hi, the call to Katie to ask her her question. Hi, Roy. Hi, Katie. Hi. Um, I work for Fulham Football Club Foundation, um, and we have a adult blind and partially sighted football group uh, currently running with about seven or eight par participants. Um, quite a sort of very recreational session. No real like um, team element yet, but that's something obviously to look to the future. Um, however, just prior to lockdown, we started a junior blind and partially sighted football session in, in Surrey. Um, okay. had two players come along to the taster session and then only one regular attendee at the weekly sessions that followed. Obviously, it then got scuppered by lockdown. Um, but I was just wondering, is there any sort of like good models to, to get the information out there to a larger group of children um, that obviously it would be beneficial to locally and kind of give them the confidence to give it a go maybe? Yeah, I think it's it's really important to reach out to local organisations, not just those ones who are involved in sport, but like for instance, um, the organisation I work for um, is is a is an organisation that supports people in sight loss with sight loss um, across all aspects of their lives. Um, so it, it's finding out, you know, who your who your local sight loss charities are. You know, they might not necessarily advertise that they that they involve that they they run sports sessions, but they would, I'm sure they could certainly help promote what you're doing. Um, you know, it's, it's that to, for particularly, you know, from, from a perspective of working for that sort of organization, any, any local, um, any local setup that creates a, a good environment for visually impaired people, you know, you want to support and you want to, you know, you want to support the growth of that. So, yeah, I'd, I'd, yeah, I wouldn't just look inside the sporting world. I'd look at, find out who your, you know, who are those, who are those sight loss charities, um, that maybe they can help. I think um, it's always a challenge, isn't it, um, finding out information about because a lot of a lot of visually impaired people go into mainstream schools now, and sort of finding that information out from schools can be quite difficult. Um, I guess. Again, these local, like your, your local sensory services, they should, they should have that sort of knowledge. They should, because they, they'll be supporting those people themselves. Um, so it's definitely worth, worth looking down that avenue because you might be able to link up, um, you might be able to link up with people through that. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. I think it's great that, um, it's great that you've got a session going, um, going down in London because it has things have been very quiet on the blind football particularly for for um for blind football I'm not so sure about partially sighted football but blind football has been quite quiet in the London area so I'd, I'd be really interested to pick this up with you my af, af, you know once af, after the meeting as well okay yeah I mean our, our adult session um started small it had sort of three or four at the beginning um, yeah. we've now got sort of seven or eight that come along with a I'd say average attendance on a week is normally five or six. Um, and I'd say probably 50% of them are blind and then 50% partially sighted. Okay. And um, you say you've started doing some junior sessions as well. That's, that's quite exciting. Yeah. So the, we had uh, two young people join us on the taster session. Um, yeah. One of them was actually a young man with partial sight who was able to play mainstream as well. Um, okay. And was sort of just about coping, but was starting to, noticed that he was behind his peers um, and right. he was starting to struggle so he was looking into whether there was that transition into 
the sort of the partially sighted football. Um, yeah. So we we sort of encourage them to come along and, and continue to do both, so that obviously he's getting to know the environment for the partially sighted environment. But then obviously you know if he can continue to play mainstream, then keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, definitely, and that's it. You you definitely don't want to separate people from those groups. You just want to um, help provide. Um, you know, provide an, an environment where, you know, they can learn, you know, they can learn new skills as well. Sometimes when you're in a, when you're in a mainstream environment, I found this particularly when I was growing up, a lot of my actual individual football skills, I learned from just playing on my own or in a small group situation in, you know, my back garden or whatever, because when the group got too big, it was hard for me to really follow what was happening. You know, if we were being taught something new, so you know, it's good to have that environment where, you know, it is a bit quieter. I was, what, that's one thing I'd say as well is don't, please don't get disheartened if you only get a few people attending for a few weeks. Remember always, and this is to anybody who's running visually impaired sessions. Remember, remember, with, you, you know, we're, we are dealing with a, it may look a lot of people when you look at sort of, you know, there's about 2 million people experiencing sight loss, but compared to the, the large, you know, the larger population, it's still a minority and it's harder to find people at the best of times. But what you're actually doing by running those sessions is the people who take, you know, you focus on the people who are taking part, you're giving them an amazing opportunity and you never know, you know, you keep, you keep plugging away at it. It might take years rather than months, but somewhere down the line, you, you know, you keep promoting it. You get, you gradually get more people taking part. It's just a case of being patient. Yeah. Thank you. But no, that's great. That's great. I'd be interested to, um, you know, to to be updated on like your, your progress, how you get on, particularly after, you know, after lockdown and how, you know, I'm sure people would be really keen, you know, to more keen than ever to sort of get involved in um, in activity, particularly as it's been a, limited so much. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you for your question, Katie. We've having. Uh, quite an influx of questions submitted via Facebook and on the Zoom chat, uh, Roy, and I'll get to those just in a second. Um, I just wanted yeah. to talk to you a little bit about your, you know, personal um, things involved around your footballing career. So, you know, many footballers have pre-match superstitions or routines <laughs> that they follow. Did you have any in particular at all? And if so, what were they? Yeah, I was... Um... I was a bit of a loner before, well, certainly before matches, I developed a, like a relaxation routine that I always did. I found that um, certainly when I started, um, my nerves used to sort of manifest themselves in like a physical way and I was very tense. So I, I had like a little, um, a little relaxation routine, kind of, kind of some things that I'd picked up from, um, from yoga uh, sessions that I'd been to um, and sort of visualization. You know, I'd, I would visualize myself doing doing positive things in the game in a in a kind of relaxed, calm state. Um, so I would do that, um, sort of like in my room before going off to sort of join in the chaos of um, of the changing room and the coach trip to or the coach trip to the ground, because I wanted to be ready. You know, in myself to then join in. You know, we we would always have like um, a playlist. Um, where we'd all contributed to so I wanted to be ready for all of the chaos and the noise that, that you get in the changing rooms um, I wanted to be ready you know on my terms so yeah I had my own little sort of private time um, of getting myself fit, um, mentally prepared and then then I would just join in with the the pandemonium, pandemonium that always was the, uh, the changing rooms <laughs> That's great, Roy. And, uh, you know, many athletes, you know, follow similar suits um, and everyone has a different preparation that they like to follow. Um, yeah, definitely. Particularly in a team environment, you've got to think, you know, you, you, you are a team and, and you want to support, um, you, you want to support um, everybody else to, to achieve the same goal. But you need to be ready individually to be able to do that as well. So, you know, it's... Um, it's important. Fantastic, right? It really is. Um, I'm going to invite Samir to ask his question. He's a young uh, man from 
uh, the London area. So, Sammy, would you like to ask your question? Uh, hi, this is Amir from uh, Australia, and I've been involved with uh, blind soccer um, about three, four years. And my question is, uh, how uh, would you back up or how would you keep going when there are uh, lots of uh, barriers, you know, and how do you, uh, what is your uh, moment, like, how can you uh, go along and uh, still continuing with so much, uh, you know, you, you come across so many barriers for getting involved uh, people with visual impairment and uh, so many people, sorry, I rephrased my question. So with, uh, you know, uh, this hard situation of uh, having so many uh, people, but they very little involved, and how can you uh, keep going and helping them out uh, to get involved with uh, uh, such a wonderful sport, soccer, which I, I have been really involved with soccer all my life, but uh, just for blind soccer, I've been uh, part of it for the last three, four years, and I'm captain of the Australian blind soccer. I think, I mean, I'd go, you know, I'm relating to my own experiences. Is that originally I was involved with um, Everton. Decide, Everton Football Club decided they wanted to run a blind football team, um, but it kind of petered out because they had so many other teams that they couldn't focus on running that team. So myself and a good friend of mine, we decided, we decided we, we'd do it ourselves because we knew we had the passion and the drive to, to do it. Um, and I guess we just kept approaching people until we found people in positions who, who were willing to help. See, the thing is, is that organisations don't, don't necessarily help on their own. You actually need individuals to to actually, to, like, to, you, if you appeal to an individual and they're passionate and they, they're really keen to, to support you, keep hold of them, <laughs> yep. Keep, yep. keep working yep. with those people, you know, you've got to try and, as best possible, surround yourself with people who are willing to help. Um, on, a, on a real basic level, I would say, make an absolute nuisance of yourself, in a nice way, obviously, but yes. I would yeah. also say at the same time, if, if you don't get that um, sort of, if that enthusiasm doesn't come back from an individual or an organisation, move on, find somebody else. Don't, don't waste your time banging on their door if they don't appear to be, you know, if they don't appear to be in a position where they want to help. You know, I've, I've, mm. and, and keep looking for people who will because there are plenty of good people out there. And again, it doesn't necessarily have to be a big organization. It could be a small one, but they've just got that real drive and desire. They, they really buy into what you're trying to do. I, I guess what I'm saying is, is just don't give up <laughs> as much as yes, anything. Definitely. There are plenty definitely. of people out there who will, who will help, you know, who will, um, who will give you that attention. But you just might have to look around for them. But trust me, it's worth it. You know, we we the Merseyside Blind Football Club that um, that we, we that we set up. You know, we've we've been competing in the Blind Football League ever since, and the clubs, you know, is the clubs doing really really well. And you know, it it was just down to it wasn't just down to us. It was down to the fact that we managed to find people, other people like us who were just as passionate. Great to hear. Thank you. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks for your time. Thanks for coming on. No worries. Thank you for your question, Amir. Um, we've had a great question submitted by Rosie on our Facebook Live, Roy. Uh, this one is, would you rather play tennis against Ronaldo or have a penalty <laughs> shootout against Andy Murray? Oh, that's interesting. I like the, that idea. Um, I think I'd like to play tennis against Ronaldo because I'm, I don't like, I'm rubbish at penalties. <laughs> it's never been my thing. <laughs> So I reckon even Andy Murray with a blindfold on, he'd probably still hit a better penalty than me. I, um, I was more of, 
I don't I don't know if I, I don't remember scoring any penalties. I was I generally score goals from open play. Um, you know, and I bet you to be fair, I bet you Ronaldo looking at the way looking at how he is his athleticism and that, I bet you he could play a lot of different sports. Yeah, he's a great athlete, yeah. Ronaldo is. Yeah. But what I'm I guess what I'm saying is that I, I think I'd have more chance of winning a tennis match against Ronaldo if he had a blindfold on than I would a penalty shootout against Andy Murray. But that's more to do with my terrible penalty taking than anything else. <laughs> that's great, Roy. It's a really difficult question, actually. Um, our next <laughs> question, I'm going to invite Sammy from uh, our Zoom chat to come on board and uh, speak to you. Uh. Yeah. Oh, great. Hi, Sammy. <clears throat> Hello. Um, as a young person, I'm quite curious, like, how do you encourage people to break down the sort of barriers that they would have put up against sort of sports in the sense of, because obviously, like, as VI people, we often get told you can't do this because you don't have it enough vision or whatever. So how do you sort of break down those barriers and help them, like, gain confidence? Well, I mean... Yeah, sorry, do you, do you mean like how do we help people who are visually impaired or help people who are working with people who are visually impaired? A bit of both, to be honest, because I know sometimes there's that hesitation of how do we tell them, like how do we help them, but also for the visually impaired person themselves, it's like we've been told we can't do this because of our vision level or because we have no vision at all, so I guess a bit yeah. of both. I think it goes back to something I said. That that particular issue goes back to something I, I said during the introduction. Actually, is that 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 is completely wrong. The your the vis well the world that we live in now, um, and you know the the amount of sporting opportunities that are out there, and you know when you look at the Paralympics, you look at the variety of sports that are played at competitive level. To say to someone that the reason you cannot play sport is because because of your visual impairment is 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 actually untrue. It's completely untrue. You know, the, it's categorically wrong to say that because mm. we we know. Um, I mean, you know, we've got the the have a go weekend this weekend going on the virtual have a go weekend, which will be exploring lots of different opportunities. Um, you know, for the people yeah. to access various different sports, and and it, there is no ex, there's, there's there's definitely an excuse for a lack of knowledge. You know, teachers, but particularly like teachers and that they they probably do one module of, of disability as a whole throughout their their whole teacher training. So mm. it's 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 forgivable to that somebody doesn't know. What is unforgivable is the lack of. Um, intention to find out that is that for me right is just completely, yeah and and that should never be accepted by anyone that that if if a teacher you know if someone had gone out there and said oh well I've looked around on the internet and there's absolutely no way any blind person all I saw was pictures of blind people basket weaving I didn't see any football I didn't see any you know then you could understand it but the fact is there's a wealth of things out Fair. there you know if you type you know, for example, blind football, if you type that on YouTube, you'll get loads and loads of highlights and from different tournaments all around the world for the last few years. And I'm sure that's the same with, with, you yeah. know, with many other blind sports. So, you know, we, yeah. just, we, we, just, we, just, we just have to not accept that. And unfortunately, you know, for every person that we're able to pass this message on to, you still meet people who, mm. you know, who've, who've not had that experience growing up and, and who were unfortunately are yeah are, are suffering because of it and it it, dri it really drives me crazy to be honest i just it you know it to, to, to think that somebody's not accessed stuff just because not because it's not out there but it's actually even worse the fact that it is out there you know and then they've not accessed yeah. it. It's, it it really makes me it, it's so it's so sad you know and i i, I just what i personally Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of people out there, you know, we just want to do the best we can. Um, we, do, we all need to work together, really. You know, wh whatever organization, yeah. you know, we're all, if, if, we're, if we're looking to support visually impaired people to get involved in sport, 
you know, we're all after the same thing, so we should all just work work closer together on on it as a you know as a bigger network. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sammy. Thanks, Sammy. Uh, Roy, just before we're sort of out of time, uh, I just wanted to sort of discuss with you a little bit about other areas of your life. I know you've spoken about your your employment, um, and obviously we've discussed football. But do you have any sort of other hobbies and interests that you sort of do in your free time at all? Well, music's a massive um, a massive one for me. I, I was a musician. Well. I don't know what defines being classed as a musician slash sportsman, but certainly I was an active musician um, before I really got involved in competitive sport. So um, from the age of eight, I've been playing in various bands and orchestras. Um, started off playing clarinet, played in the youth orchestra. Um, I was I was poached by the world of heavy rock and um and metal and stuff when I was in my teens. I got into a band playing drums and I've played drums ever since. Um, there was a point actually, so when I, first, when I started, when things started getting serious with the football, I was, I was working a lot with bands. It's just that coming home at two, three o'clock in the morning after a gig does not coincide well with having to get up at half six, seven in the morning to go running. So um, I decided I, that the, the music just needed to, be put on the back burner but then music has probably been the most important thing for me in terms of dealing with um challenges within sport so whenever i've i've had a you know i've had a bad experience at a tournament or you know whenever i've got some free time and you know music's been my sort of go-to thing for relieving pressure um i had i had to have surgery on both my feet um a few years ago and I was out of action for months and, um, you know, playing, well, I, I really got into playing guitar. I, I actually wrote, I actually wrote an album at the time and it was, you know, it was, it, it was that, it was that music that kind of, um, kind of helped me get through it, to be fair. That's incredible, Roy. And uh, obviously with your uh, talent there for playing the drums, I believe you once featured in an advert for a particular beer brand how was that and how did that sort of come about it was very random and um it was so quite often particularly when you start off playing in bands you play you end up playing in these pubs or venues where basically your best friend's dad's dog is the only person watching you <laughs> and but it was a reminder that even the small these small gigs where you feel like you're only paying to about four three or four people are actually you never know where those those things can lead to because it was somebody had watched me play at the cavern um a few years ago it was it was like just some random little gig and he messaged me and said that his his friend was a producer and that um i might fit the bill for this advert they're looking at so i just got in touch and um yeah lo and behold i got sent the script and yeah it was this um this thing where basically i get loads of uh, beer poured all over me whilst playing the drums. Uh, part part of it being shirtless, so it was it wasn't it, <laughs> it was a great experience. It was honestly it was um, it was it was great fun to do, and I, I think it you know the advert was twenty one twenty two seconds long, and I was just I was fascinated at the detail that goes into putting together something even that short and having to compose a little a little piece that fits with not only fits with the, the message that they're sending, but also fits into that short period of time. Um, it was amazing. It, it really, um, it was, I'd, you know, those sorts of experiences. And it made me realize like the importance of never, of never turning down an opportunity. I was saying, you know, if play, you can complain about playing a gig in front of two or three people or going and playing a football match in front of a handful of people. But, um, you know, you just never know where it can lead to. That's fantastic, Roy. And, you know, taking those opportunities is something that everyone should do, even if it's, there's a little bit of uncertainty there, because you never know what it will lead to, like you say. Oh, absolutely. You know, is, there's, a, um, there's a saying in football, isn't there? Um, 100% of the shots that you don't take, you don't score. 
<laughs> so, uh, you know, you can apply that to so many different things. Very true. Uh, we've had a question on Facebook, Roy, from Joe Sharp. And her question is, what is your FA Cup prediction for this Saturday? Um, <laughs> well, I've, I have a massive vested interest in that, obviously being a, um, being a Chelsea fan. Um, despite growing up in Liverpool, um, family connections meant that I was brainwashed from a very young age. Um, yeah, I, I, think, um, I think Chelsea will do it. I think, um, I think if they can, the problem they've got, I, I think it'll be a high scoring game. Um, Chelsea can't defend very well, um, <laughs> but they will score goals. I think 3 2 to Chelsea. Let's hope that result comes in for all the Chelsea fans out there. I mean, I don't think Chelsea's defending is quite as bad as Arsenal's at the time, but hey. To be fair, they look better. Chelsea looked better when they when they played the three centre backs and then the wing backs because their their wing backs generally aren't the best defensively, but they're great going forward. So yeah, I think it'll be um, it should be a good game. It'll it'll um it'll come back. At me now, it'll be nil nil, won't it? Now we'll go to penalties. <laughs> and we've just had Mark pop in the chat there. He won't say anything as he's a Man United fan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well, we're, we're both in the Champions League now. They managed to pip us to the third place spot. Um, I was, I must say, I was really surprised. I, I thought the way Man United were playing, I thought they'd, they'd, um, they'd have the number, have a number on us that uh, last weekend. There we go. So, uh, just a couple more questions, Roy. Um, obviously, you're a Paralympic and international footballer. You know, you're a, a well-known musician. You've also been a TV judge, which people don't really know. <laughs> um, but what would you say is your biggest achievement that you, in your life so far? Biggest achievement? Um, oh... Biggest achievement? That can be sporting or it can be in other areas of your life as well, Roy. Probably learning to butter bread. I'm terrible at it. I have been for the last few years. And then just suddenly, um, if, yeah, I, I just never mastered it properly. <laughs> it's, it's funny you should say that, Roy, because I actually <laughs> butter my bread using a spoon. Well, maybe I should try that because um, so, yeah, yeah, my that... technique's been failing me for years and years, so... So what I use is the back end of a spoon to, you know, scrape a little <laughs> bit out and then you get a nice smooth finish and a good uh, amount of butter to bread ratio there. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I think I th maybe on a more serious note, I, I would say <laughs> that for me, um, I would say, and it, it probably applies to a lot of things that I've done, is my, my greatest achievement, I would say, is is always believing that I can improve is, is, and always being able to back that up um, you, you know, and, and sticking to the, same, to the same message that I try and send out to everybody else. I, I definitely believe that I live in that way. You know, I, I wasn't a naturally gifted sports person, I wouldn't say. You know, I had great experiences growing up, which definitely counted towards me being able to do the things that I do now. But the one thing that really rang true was I wasn't afraid of making mistakes and I still not now, you know, I'm, I'm very reflective and, you know, I, I will always look to, to improve, you know, I, with, with the football, you know, I was, I was left out of the European championship squad in 2011 in, or in October, which, you know, was less than a year before uh, London 2012 took place. So I was again in that sort of underdog situation. Um, and whilst they were all away in the way at the tournament, I, I, I stripped everything back. I, I, I looked at the, the skills that I needed to improve. It didn't matter about scoring goals. What mattered was making contributions. And I worked so hard on all my basic skills. And unfortunately, actually, in that league season, the goals came. And, um, you know, I was second top scorer in the league. I'd never scored a goal in the league before that season. And... Um, I made it impossible for the coaches not to pick me. So I would say my biggest achievement really is, is being able to come from an, at that underdog position and putting myself in that strong position um, 
you know, that's, yeah, as well as butter and bread, obviously. <laughs> no, that's great, Roy, how you, you know, you face those challenges head on and think of ways to overcome them. Um, so while we're sort of still on the subject of your career a little bit, if you could go back and reflect on it, you know, going way back to when you were competing in cross country, etc. What one bit of advice would you actually give to your younger self? Um, what advice? Um, don't let girls put you off. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a ladies' man, are you, Roy? No, they, well, <laughs> no. I would say, I would, I would, I would say, actually one of the most important things is to always have things to back you up. So we, we had a situation in 2013, for instance, where we didn't qualify for the World Cup in 2014. And I realised in that period of time that I wasn't doing anything away from football to, to help me deal with, with that. And I, I had quite a difficult time of it those, those few months. And it reflected on relationships I had at the time. Um, you know, I was, I was so, so, so football focused, even on my downtime, that I could never relax. And I just wasn't very good company, probably. And then, so I would probably turn around and say, is never forget the importance of, of, of doing other things. You know, once I got back into playing my music regularly, um, and once I, I'd... Sort of remembered that it isn't a crime even when you're a professional athlete it's not a crime to go and socialize with people as long as you you know you are looking after yourself you know it's fine that you need that thing it's actually an important part of being being an athlete you know you're a complete person and if you're not happy within yourself then you're not going to be able to get the best out of yourself in, in terms of performance as well so yeah that's probably the message i would give i would give to my younger self that's great, Roy. And having that, you know, work balance, well, work social life balance is a, a massive thing for everybody, not just athletes. Um, I'd like to also thank you for today. You've been great. Oh, well, thanks so much for, for, um, for everybody. So thanks, for, thanks for having me on. Thanks for inviting me on. And thanks so much for everybody who's, um, who's listened in and, and asked questions. Um, you know, if, if, if anybody... You know, I'm, I'd, I'll talk to anyone. So if there's even, you know, beyond this, beyond this call, if, you know, if I can help anyone in any way to, to access, you know, to access sport better or, you know, what, whatever it might be, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to help. No, thank you, Roy. And just to reiterate the point that he's made there, thank you everybody for joining us today on episode three of the Paralympic podcast. Roy, you've been great, as I've said, and uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on board.